Hey everyone, this is Eric again from Stanford University and the Palo Alto VA Hospital. This is the first video in a five video series on sodium and potassium disorders, and the topic will be the normal physiology involved in sodium, potassium, and water balance. I personally really enjoy this topic, but I appreciate this may not be true for everyone. So my goal here is to make this video the last lecture on this topic you'll ever need by explaining the content as clearly as possible using plenty of diagrams, as well as making it thorough enough to include all the details you may need to know down the road. The maintenance of a healthy and stable balance in the concentrations of sodium and potassium, along with the appropriate amount of water in our bodies, is a classic example of homeostasis. Control of this particular homeostasis is a highly complicated process involving numerous interconnected physiologic pathways, dozens of enzymes, and over a dozen hormones. Luckily, a complete understanding of all of this is not necessary for the routine practice of medicine. However, a sufficient understanding for medical practice is still quite involved, and if you are coming into this video series already feeling overwhelmed by this topic, don't worry, that's very common. I found that Sodium potassium water homeostasis can be made more accessible by teaching it in layers, starting from a big picture without specifics, then moving to the details of individual pathways, and ending with a return to the big picture, now with the details filled in. This is the learning process I'll be using here. I won't be turning you into the world expert in the physiology, but rather provide you all of the necessary physiology background to allow you to diagnose and treat the vast majority of patients with disorders of sodium and potassium balance. The key players of sodium potassium water homeostasis that I'll be discussing can be broken down into three categories. There are three major hormones, seven minor hormones, and two critical enzymes. If it's not listed here, it's not clinically relevant. So let me start now with a big picture without details. This will represent the sodium, potassium, and water that is present in our blood. There are four arms or domains of physiologic processes that closely interact to keep these in balance. First is the GI system. We take in these electrolytes and water and food. Some of this gets absorbed in the GI tract and some gets secreted. Whatever remains in the GI tract that either wasn't absorbed or was actively secreted is then expelled in the feces. The next arm is the renal system. The electrolytes in water and blood travel to the kidneys where they are freely and passively filtered through the glomeruli, a process which I'll discuss slightly more in detail later. The vast majority of filtered electrolytes in water gets reabsorbed by the kidneys and re-enters the circulation. The small fraction that doesn't ends up in the urine. Next, we have the intracellular space. This is the relatively abstract fluid compartment composed of the sum of the interiors of every cell in the body. It's obviously not an organ system the way the GI and renal systems are, but still plays a critical role here because potassium and water experience transmembrane shifts in response to pathology. That is, certain disease states will trigger potassium or water to move into cells or out of cells. Now, any student who has had cell biology might say, wait a minute, Sodium moves back and forth across cell membranes too, for example, the ubiquitous sodium-potassium ATP pump. And that's definitely true, but all I'll say is that derangements of serum sodium levels are virtually never caused by derangements in the transmembrane shift of sodium, though they can certainly be caused by derangements in the transmembrane shift of water, which I'll discuss later. The final of the four arms is the endocrine system. If you're wondering, those things are meant to be your adrenal glands. The endocrine system acts by mediating or controlling the other three systems using hormones. Hormones are substances in the body, usually steroids or polypeptides, that are released into the circulation by various different endocrine glands and which act at sites distant from where they are synthesized. This diagram represents homeostasis of sodium, potassium, and water in a nutshell. The next step in understanding all of this is to learn a little bit more about the details of the individual pathways involved. There are two specific pathways here that are important, which are known as axes. 
In physiology, an axis is a sequential set of direct influences and feedback mechanisms that link a collection of closely related endocrine glands and target organs. I'm not personally a fan of the term axis in this context, but it's so ingrained in the language of physiology that we're probably stuck with it. As far as electrolytes and water are concerned, the more important of the two is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. The less important of the two in regards to this topic specifically is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. I'll talk about each. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis begins in the liver with a constitutive production and release of a prehormone or hormone precursor called angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen is converted to, in the circulation to another prehormone called angiotensin 1. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme renin, which itself is secreted into the circulation by the kidneys in response to various stimuli, most notably decreased blood pressure in the arteries that supply the kidney. Angiotensin 1 is then converted to the active hormone angiotensin 2. This is catalyzed by the angiotensin converting enzyme produced in multiple locations in the body, but primarily the lungs. Unlike renin, a clinically relevant stimulus for secretion of this enzyme is not well understood or described. Angiotensin II has many of its own actions, but one of them is in the adrenal glands, where it stimulates conversion of steroid precursors into another important hormone called aldosterone. So in summary, low blood pressure in the kidney results in secretion of renin, the ultimate result of which is increased levels of circulating angiotensin II and aldosterone. So what are the specific actions of these hormones in the kidney where their direct effect on electrolyte balance occurs? Here's a schematic of a nephron, the basic functional unit of the kidney, of which each kidney has about a million. First, we have the blood supply, which originates in the renal artery and ends up in the afferent arterial. Some of the water and electrolytes will be freely filtered across the glomerulus, which is in reality a much more complex structure than this picture makes it appear. The portion of blood that is not filtered is taken away from the glomerulus via the efferent arterial. The electrolytes and water, among other compounds that are filtered, move next into the proximal convoluted tubule, where much of the sodium is reabsorbed along with the bicarbonate ions, which maintains electrical neutrality. This process is stimulated by angiotensin II. Then the fluid moves into a structure called the loop of Henle and ends up in a, a stretch called the thick ascending limb. There is a co-transporter membrane protein here that leads to simultaneous reabsorption of sodium, chloride, and potassium. Next, in the distal convoluted tubule, we find a sodium chloride co-transporter that allows more reabsorption of those ions. Neither of those co-transporters are under known direct hormonal control. Finally, as we move further towards the collecting ducts, we have several different cell types. One cell type, called the principal cells, reabsorbs sodium and excretes potassium in response to aldosterone. Another cell type, called the uh, intercalated cells, excretes hydrogen ions in response to aldosterone and reabsorbs potassium in response to low serum potassium. At this point, what remains in the lumen of the nephron is essentially urine, and it drains to the ureters and the bladder. Of course, I've highly simplified here the functions of the nephron and mostly limited it to the actions of angiotensin II and aldosterone. Despite the superficial appearance to the contrary, the key feature of the RAA access in the nephron is not limited to its role in the reabsorption of sodium, but also includes the reabsorption of water, which follows sodium due to osmotic pressure. The actual mechanisms of this, most notably countercurrent multiplication and urea recycling, are fascinating, but of minimal clinical relevance, so I will spare you right now and refer those interested to a physiology textbook. There is one more aspect of the nephron to discuss as it relates to the RAA axis. Adjacent to the glomerulus exist some endothelial cells that line the afferent arterial called juxtaglomerular cells. These cells can both sense the decrease in the perfusion pressure or can experience activation of adrenergic beta-1 receptors in response to something like epinephrine. When either of these things occur, the juxtaglomerular cells produce and release the enzyme renin.
The most obvious and important consequence of the system occurs in patients who are hypotensive due to hypovolemia or severe infection. The decreased renal perfusion leads to secretion of renin. As I said earlier, uh, renin release results in increased angiotensin II and aldosterone, both of which act to increase reabsorption of sodium, and the increased oncotic pressure from the reabsorbed sodium will aid in the reabsorption of water, which is, which is the ultimate goal because it will expand the intravascular volume and thus restore blood pressure to normal. You may have noticed an interesting side benefit from this mechanism. Many of these hypotensive patients, particularly those with infection, are likely to be acidemic. That is, they are likely to have low serum pH from accumulation of lactic acid. The mechanisms by which both angiotensin II and aldosterone lead to sodium reabsorption also lead to increased serum pH which will usually be an adaptive uh, response, for example, in severe infections. However, it can occasionally be maladaptive as in side effects of excessive doses of diuretic medications where it can lead to um, a serum pH that's unusually high. That is often referred to as a contraction alkalosis and will be discussed a little bit more in a future video. In addition to the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, we also have the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Although this particular collection of glands and structures is critical for many processes in the body, it actually plays just a minor role in sodium potassium water homeostasis and only becomes significant in a small handful of pathologic processes. The axis begins here in the brain at a small and wonderfully complex structure called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus more or less sits in the center of the brain's inferior surface and has a close anatomic relationship with the pituitary gland, which is actually two separate glands pressed up against each other. The posterior pituitary is in physical communication with the hypothalamus via a structure called the infundibulum, also known as the pituitary stalk. And the hypothalamus is in communication with the anterior pituitary via blood vessels that carry blood away from the former and to the latter to allow targeted delivery of hormones. This is called the hypophyseal portal system. Please note that this schematic is not drawn to scale. In reality, the pituitary gland is much, much, much smaller than the brain. The hypothalamus itself has a huge number of roles in mediating everything from circadian rhythms to body temperature to appetite and even some emotions. The role we're interested in here is as a liaison between the nervous system and the endocrine system. One component of that role is the production of a hormone called corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH. CRH is released into the hypophyseal portal system and travels to the anterior pituitary, where it stimulates secretion into the systemic circulation of a second hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. ACTH's major role is in the adrenal glands, where it stimulates the conversion of various steroid precursors into a third hormone called cortisol. Cortisol has many actions in the body. Limiting them to those related to this discussion, it includes dilation of the afferent renal arterioles, which leads to increased filtration across the glomerulus, which is quantified using a value called the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. And when in pathologic excess, cortisol can start to display some of the same actions as aldosterone, though this action is minimal in normal individuals. The primary stimulus for the HPA axis is either physiologic or even emotional stress, which directly increases both CRH and ACTH independently. And there is a critical feedback mechanism by which circulating cortisol inhibits both CRH and ACTH release also independently. The HPA axis is not the only component of these organs relevant to this topic. In fact, antidiuretic hormone, also known as ADH, as well as vasopressin, is even more important. Like CRH, ADH is formed in the hypothalamus. Unlike CRH, however, which is released into the hypophyseal portal system to go to the anterior pituitary, ADH migrates in secretory granules down axons from the hypothalamus that extend directly through the infundibulum into the posterior pituitary. Once in the posterior pituitary, the secretion is primarily triggered by detection of high serum osmolarity, but also to a lesser extent, uh, low blood pressure, and even circulating angiotensin II.
Once ADH is released into the systemic circulation, it has two major actions. In the kidneys, it promotes water reabsorption in the distal tubules and collecting ducts. It does this by stimulating the insertion of water channels called aquaporin-2 channels into the endothelium of the distal tubules and collecting duct, which are otherwise relatively impervious to water. And in the systemic blood vessels, ADH induces vasoconstriction. The final hormones to discuss individually in detail are the natriuretic peptides. These hormones are secreted predominantly from the heart and have two dominant types. Atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP, predominantly comes from the atria, which seems obvious from the name. However, confusingly, the second type is usually called brain natriuretic peptide, or BNP, which comes from the ventricles. It's called brain because that's the organ where it was originally identified, although subsequently it appears to be more important when secreted by the heart. In order to help avoid confusion regarding terminology, some people are now referring to BNP as B-type natriuretic peptide. Both ANP and BNP are released in response to myocardial stretch, which is usually the consequence of volume expansion. Their actions appear to be predominantly vasodilation, as well as promotion of sodium and water secretion. From their actions, they can be thought of as antagonists to the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. Unfortunately, we haven't known about the natriuretic peptides for all that long. Also, historically, the actions and significance of most hormones were studied largely by removing the organ that secretes them in animals and seeing what happens to the animal's physiology. For obvious reasons, this can't be done in the case of uh, ANP and BNP, so their exact physiologic role and degree of significance remains somewhat unknown. For viewers that like lists and charts, here are two charts for you that I won't verbally review, but you can pause the video and take notes if you like. These are essentially a summary of everything covered so far. The first chart here covers the major mediators of sodium, potassium, and water balance, which are angiotensin II, aldosterone, and ADH. The second covers the minor mediators of CRH, ACTH, cortisol, ANP, and BNP. Returning just for a second to our original big picture overview, you see that so far I've been giving all the individual details about the endocrine and renal systems. Now there is surprisingly nothing really to say about the GI system until we start talking about a couple of etiologies of various pathologies that will be reserved for future videos. However, the one topic that still deserves some details at this point is the transmembrane shift of water and potassium. Let's take a look at how these shifts actually work. Starting with water, I'm going to let this box schematically represent a typical cell. Inside the cell, I'll put some sodium ions, not too many because the intracellular concentration of sodium is relatively low, and I'll put in a lot more sodium ions outside the cell. Then I'll add some potassium ions, this time many more inside the cell than out, which is roughly how these ions are actually distributed in all cells. The difference in concentrations between the intracellular and extracellular components is maintained by that ubiquitous sodium-potassium ATPase that I referred to earlier that pumps each of those ions against its electrochemical gradient. Let's suppose that we start off with a normal extracellular sodium concentration and normal oncotic pressure both inside and out. Let's further suppose that we have a patient who is diabetic and for some reason, maybe lack of medication compliance or maybe acute illness, his or her serum glucose starts to increase. Since glucose cannot freely diffuse across the cell membrane, if the rate of glucose formation exceeds the cell's capacity to uptake it, the concentration of glucose will start to increase. As it does so, we find ourselves with a situation in which there is a very high extracellular oncotic pressure with still normal intracellular oncotic pressure. Since water is able to move in and out of most cells with relative ease, this oncotic pressure gradient immediately disappears. That is, high oncotic pressure sort of pulls water towards it from the intracellular space to the extracellular space. As this occurs, the cell literally shrinks until the oncotic pressure in both spaces or compartments is the same. Now what's happened to the extracellular sodium concentration 
which is equal to the serum sodium. We have the same number of sodium ions as before, but now they are in a greater amount of water. Therefore, our previously normal serum sodium concentration has become abnormally low. To generalize this process, whenever the body produces or is given an excessive amount of an extracellular solute that lacks the ability to be rapidly taken up by cells, for example glucose, or a drug called mannitol, the consequence is low serum sodium, a specific situation called hypertonic hyponatremia. The word hypertonic refers to the fact that the total solute concentration in the extracellular fluid is higher than normal. Next, I'll review transmembrane shifts of potassium. In this case, instead of sodium being the other ion of interest, it's actually the hydrogen ion. In every cell, even in patients with completely normal acid-base status, there are free hydrogen ions floating around, just as there are hydrogen ions loose in the extracellular space. Usually the hydrogen ion concentration is relatively low, but what if it starts to increase? Processes that could do this include severe hydration or infections, which ultimately lead to a conversion in cells from aerobic, oxygen-requiring respiration to anaerobic or oxygen-free respiration. A consequence of anaerobic respiration is the accumulation of lactic acid as a byproduct. This acid is released into the circulation at a rate greater than that at which the body can clear it. The result is accumulation of hydrogen ions and a decrease in serum pH, a situation called acidemia. These excess extracellular hydrogen ions shift the equilibrium governing their concentration, which begins to drive them into the intracellular space. However, to maintain electrical neutrality, potassium ions shift outward. The exact details of how, of how this process works is not clinically relevant. But um, while this transmembrane exchange may help to blunt a critical decrease in serum pH, it does so at the expense of causing a high serum potassium concentration known as hyperkalemia. So in summary, acidemia leads to modest hyperkalemia. By the converse of that mechanism, alkalemia can lead to a very modest hypokalemia. In addition to acid-base disturbances, a few other factors can lead to transmembrane shifts of potassium. So exercise and treatment with a beta blocker class of medications can lead to hyperkalemia and insulin and activation of beta-2 receptors by circulating catecholamines like epinephrine can lead to hypokalemia. Going back to the overview of the structure of this video's content, I've covered the big picture without the details, then the individual pathways separately with the details, and now I'll conclude by putting those small details back into the big picture. The next two diagrams will synthesize everything we've learned so far. So let me review the actions of the hormones involved in sodium, potassium, and water homeostasis. The first step is that sodium, potassium, and water is absorbed by the GI tract and find their way into the blood. And the blood is cycled through the kidneys. A significant portion of that sodium, potassium, and water is freely filtered through the glomeruli. Some portion of each of those will be reabsorbed in the tubules and collecting ducts. Angiotensin II and aldosterone both directly stimulate reabsorption of sodium and indirectly the reabsorption of water. Aldosterone prevents reabsorption of potassium. ADH strongly encourages reabsorption of water without directly affecting reabsorption of the others. And ANP and BNP block reabsorption of sodium and thus indirectly prevent reabsorption of water. In other words, ANP and BNP antagonize the RAA axis and ADH as part of the checks and balances to prevent excessive reabsorption and excessive volume expansion. Although not relevant at physiologic levels, when pathologically elevated, cortisol can lead to identical effects as aldosterone. And any sodium, potassium, or water that is not reabsorbed gets eliminated in the urine. In addition to hormone action in the kidneys, some other hormones can specifically impact potassium shifts between the blood and intracellular space. Specifically, insulin and catecholamines like epinephrine drive potassium from the extracellular space like blood to the intracellular space. The major end effects of the system are as follows. Angiotensin II promotes increased intravascular volume and thus increased blood pressure. Aldosterone also promotes increased intravascular volume and blood pressure.
as well as decreasing serum potassium. And ADH promotes increased volume and pressure while decreasing sodium. For reasons difficult to concisely explain, pathologic abnormalities of ADH tend to impact serum sodium to a much greater degree than they impact volume and blood pressure. In other words, patients with unusually elevated levels of ADH um, often develop symptoms of low sodium without developing overt edema or significant hypertension. And the converse holds true for patients with unusually low levels of ADH or resistance to ADH. I'll discuss both of those scenarios in more depth in the videos on hyper and hyponatremia. If you had to pick one screenshot from this video to memorize, I would probably make it this one. For the second of the two summary diagrams, I'll review the hormonal regulation of intravascular volume and blood pressure from an anatomic and more complete perspective. This will be a natural extension of the last diagram. As we've seen, regulation of the volume and blood pressure in the body is an incredibly complex process that involves most of uh, the body's organs. The key players are the kidney, the hypothalamus, the anterior and posterior pituitary glands, the adrenals, and the blood vessels. However, the liver, lungs, and heart all play a role as well. So how are all of these anatomically distinct structures linked? Let's imagine the physiologic derangement of low systemic blood pressure, which necessarily results in low renal perfusion pressure. This triggers the juxtaglomerular cells in the kidney to release renin. Renin converts the pre-hormone angiotensinogen produced by the liver to angiotensin 1. This is then converted to the active hormone angiotensin 2 by the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme, which itself is primarily produced in the lungs. Simultaneous to that, CRH produced by the hypothalamus under the influence of physiologic and emotional stress promotes release of ACTH from the anterior pituitary, which then travels to the adrenals. In the adrenal glands, ACTH stimulates conversion of various steroid precursors, both to aldosterone as well as cortisol. Another major action of angiotensin II is to further stimulate the production of aldosterone specifically. Now, angiotensin II and aldosterone together, along with cortisol when in pathologic excess, have complex actions in the kidney, in the proximal and distal tubule respectively. The most predominant results of those actions are sodium reabsorption caused by both, bicarb reabsorption caused by angiotensin II, and potassium and hydrogen ion secretion by aldosterone. The last three of those four actions lead to hypokalemia and a metabolic alkalosis, which are often incidental to the major consequence of the sodium reabsorption, which is stimulation of water reabsorption. Water reabsorption expands the intravascular volume and helps to restore blood pressure. Angiotensin II also directly stimulates vasoconstriction, which further increases blood pressure. Now, another aspect of volume and pressure regulation deals with ADH. ADH release is primarily stimulated by elevated serum osmolarity, which can be seen in some forms of dehydration, though low blood pressure is also a direct stimulus as well. ADH promotes water reabsorption as well as vasoconstriction. At this point, you may be thinking, wow, that looks really complicated, but I'm not quite done. There are still some examples of negative feedback to mention that is a couple of checks and balances. First and most importantly, the improved blood pressure that is the end result of this process leads to inhibition of renin release. Another form of negative feedback is that the increased systemic blood pressure, along with increased intravascular volume, together lead to increased intracardiac pressure this stimulates the heart to release ANP and BNP, and ANP and BNP block many of the actions of the RAA system in the kidneys, as well as induce vasodilation. Finally, cortisol, though it usually plays only a very minor role here, does inhibit both ACTH and CRH release. So there it is, as a complete, a summary of hormonal control of volume and blood pressure that you'll ever likely need to know as a practicing clinician. If you can reproduce this, you have likely mastered this topic. There is one final thing I'd like to discuss very briefly here because it will make certain issues in the subsequent videos on sodium and potassium easier to understand, and that is the sites of action of various diuretics. A diuretic is any substance that promotes formation of urine 
usually through inhibiting reabsorption of sodium in the tubules, which increases the tubular luminal osmotic pressure and thus prevents water reabsorption. So here's a nephron again that we saw earlier. Each place along the nephron where salt or water is reabsorbed has its own class of diuretic. In the proximal tubule, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, such as acetazolamide, block here. The thick ascending limb is where loop diuretics, such as furosemide and fumetanide, act. The thiazide diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide and metolazone, act in the distal convoluted tubule. And the so-called potassium-sparing diuretics, like spironolactone, block sodium reabsorption in the principal cells. In addition to meds that directly block sodium reabsorption, there are uncommonly used ADH antagonists that directly prevent reabsorption of water. And for the sake of completeness, mannitol is a unique diuretic that promotes water loss in the urine by acting as an osmotically active substance in the tubular lumen. So that does it. That's my complete overview of how the human body normally maintains homeostasis of sodium, potassium, and water. I know it may have seemed unusually thorough, but I hope I provided you all of the background physiology necessary to understand the many disorders of sodium and potassium imbalance. Feel free to ask any questions or share any thoughts in the comments section. The subsequent four videos in the series will cover hyponatremia, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, and hyperkalemia.